view uh, that is now uh, following our online conversation on the West, a new haven for the Muslims Brotherhood's planetary nebula. It's uh, quite an extensive title, a title uh, that uh, uh, really becomes uh, very uh, crucial in the international political agenda when we are witnessing a revolution from a Muslim population against um, its regime that uh, is based on a fanatic interpretation of Islam that uh, is not organically uh, part of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it, from a ver variety of points of view, it's very much linked to uh, one of our speakers, Cynthia Farhat, will have time to address a bit the issue. Um, and at the same time that uh, the European Parliament as well takes notice of uh, the incredible amount of money that the European institutions have been given to front organizations of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and of course, this is uh, the organizations that are obviously linked with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and it does not include uh, those organizations that are uh, hiding its uh, links with the organization. And uh, um, the Budget Control Committee uh, has uh, finally is been is looking at it um and yes 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 <laughs> speaking about the budget control committee and here we have uh, the member of the european parliament thomas Zudowski. thank you so much for accepting this invitation uh and to uh, be with us to discuss the the west and new haven for the muslim brotherhood planetary nebula and uh, uh just let me tell you that uh, this is not the first time that people think about this, uh, this uh, what I call nebula. Most of the times it is, has been referred as the global network of the Muslim Brotherhood because there was an Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in 1928, but then it developed in a variety of ways. Uh, there has been, for instance, a very interesting uh, set of articles that was done in the beginning of this year uh, by uh, a journalist of a French magazine, uh, Le Point, um, that uh, uh, used the expression of galaxy, the Muslim Brotherhood galaxy, Clément Petrou uh, is the name of the journalist. And I am proposing uh, an even more, uh, you know, diffuse concept, which is this planetary nebula, which I think that's what it is. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really something that, uh, uh, that has a, a very weird form. But uh, as uh, uh, Cynthia Farhat, um, that accepted our invitation, Cynthia, she is um, an, uh, an Egyptian-American. She was born uh, in Egypt. She is in the United States. She has uh, already, uh, although she's quite young, she has already an impressive curricula. And she just authored um, a landmark book on the organization uh, that uh, I'm sure she will be uh, speaking about. Um, and uh, this is around the secret apparatus. That's the, 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 the main concept, the main thing that she is uh, developing in connection with the Muslim Brotherhood. But uh, we will start by um, uh, short interventions of both our speakers in this conversation. We will start by Thomas. Thomas, uh, a Czech politician, deputy leader of the Czech Christian Democratic Party, crisis manager, media analyst, poet, author, and since 2014, a member of the European Parliament for the European People's Party. Uh, he is um, a leader of the Parliament's initiative to combat EU funding 
to when it is connected to terrorist groups, uh, to strengthen the EU action against homegrown radicalization, the spread of violent extremist ideology, and the emergence of politically motivated violent extremism. He's a vice chair of the Committee on Budgetary Control and a member of the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs. Uh, before his election, he was a CEO of a PR and communication company. And he has been addressing this issue of uh, the European financing um, of uh, this uh, uh, planetary nebula of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and uh, he has uh, uh, really uh, give, gave the sign that the Budgetary Control Committee uh, uh, is going to uh, address the issue. Uh, that's very important, you know, uh, perhaps you do not know, but I was, uh, in my previous capacity, I was vice president of the Budgetary Committee <laughs> as well, and uh, I started, you know, understanding a bit uh, these issues when I was exactly in your position, and I would like to commend very much what you have been doing, what uh, the declarations you have made, and um, without taking more of your time, please, Thomas, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paulo. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. Dear audience, it's my honor to be here with you and with experts like you that uh, really your start and description about me and about the leadership in the issue of uh, Muslim brotherhoods or extremists, what are really now taking the European um, money. It's really right and it's very good description of the of the topics. You said that I'm a vice chair of budgetary control committee and from this perspective I have, have it many information about criminals in the EU and you know that uh, I am really systematically working on the issue of the security and for me is security um, of the of EU my biggest priority. Also, everybody knows in European Parliament that um, since 2015 there has been a new wave of Islamic attacks. Also, 130 were killed in uh, uh, in Paris attacks and uh, 86 in Nice in 2016, 32 uh, in March 2016 in Brussels, bombings and could continue uh, for some time. So, so the response of the EU was very weak. National security securities remains the competence of the member states, but terrorists do not care about the law or our division of competence. What they attack and uh, why they target the EU? Because they can go across the border and sometimes the cooperation and connection between the states doesn't function very well. And the cooperation between our intelligences and special police department, what are really on focus for fighting the jihadists, it doesn't function and it's a big problem. I cannot say and make clear link between the jihadists or, or Muslim brotherhoods. But I think that uh, it's very important that uh, in many countries, including Austria, is Muslim brotherhoods really decided as a terrorist organization. And in many countries worldwide too. Every European uh, country security services report every single year on its operation. Also, it's very important. The German security services report says, and I quote, that goal of the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, still today, they, the uh, ideology of its found Hassan al Banna, is that establish of a political and social system based on the Quran and Sunnah. Numerous um, Islamist and some case terrorist organizations such as the uh, Palestinian Hamas or the Egyptian Al-Gama 
Islam Mia emerge from the Muslim Brotherhoods. Also, there is clear link between this organization and some of terrorist organization. Muslim Brotherhood aims to create in Islamic State uh, gov uh, government only by Islamic law sh Sharia. Also, it's very important and they are rich in democracy and uh, uh, elected parliamentarians because in their opinion, God is the sole law giver. Also, it's very important that Muslim Brotherhood is legal and operates within the EU because of our weak system. And this is my description, what I said first in, in the European, European Parliament on the conference these years. And many of um, EU politicians were surprised because EU even provides financing to dozens of NGOs and organizations uh, that are connected to Muslim Brotherhood. In November 2020, Germany stopped all funding to the organization after a federal audit showed that it uh, undermined constitutional. The Netherlands did the same in 2021. And uh, that organization still received the EU money to be pr uh, precise. That organization contracted 1.35 million from the European Commission from 2020. In 2019, organization of which Islamic community, Mele Gurus, a member received 887,950 euros from the EU budget. And the government of uh, France, the UK, Germany, Austria, and United States uh, uh, repeatedly asked the parliamentarians to take great steps to outlaw such organization. Parliaments rapidly uh, heard experts, respects professor and leaders who state fact to provide academic evidence to support these claims, but Muslim uh, Brotherhood still operates. Muslim Brotherhood used the charities and other communities-based organization to spread in anti-democratic hate ideology, but the EU is blind to this. Why? Because it's fear uh, being called discriminatory discriminatory. EU Commission and uh, lawmakers around Europe fear uh, the word Islamophobia. But at the same time, the support of terrorists with trying to fight Islamophobia. The governments missed the, sh uh, the shot by pouring millions into organizations uh, uh, that are uh, radicaliz uh, radicalizing and spreading violent extremists. The attention is to support moderate Islam group, what is Morocco or some of states doing, but in the end, the money ends in support of terrorists. We found our own threats that uh, the founding provides legacy to, to this organization and gives them a free pass to operate in Europe. This issue is very hard to raise, but uh, it needs talking about. In October, I organized the conference what I mentioned in European Parliament. I hosted ambassador uh, from the MENA region, NATO representative from the commissions, uh, director of Frontex and EIS, and they are agree that we need to do more. And I'm working very hard to make European Parliament pay attention Muslim Brotherhoods. Thank you very much for this invitation. And I hope that uh, we will continue with our discussion. And I'm following both of you. And I know that both of you are real experts on this problematic. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I am absolutely uh, warm-hearted to see that uh, 
things continue uh, in the European Parliament. Um, those who want to struggle for our common values are there. Uh, and there are people that is not fooled by uh, this uh, vocabulary and this uh, pretense of being open and modernist and so on with uh, this um, Islamophobia uh, sort of speech because uh, we have to be very clear. Uh, who is Islamophobic? Islamophobic are those who think that Muslim women have less rights than other women. That Muslim women uh, uh, must can be forced to wear in a certain fashion that uh, some think uh, is their way of seeing Islam. Uh, this is Islamophobia. Uh, discrimination against the rights of the Muslim women. And actually, you know, I, I do remember uh, an association that was created here in Belgium, uh, which was uh, uh, francophone. It was called uh, uh, Insoumise et Dévoilé, which means uh, fundamentally without veil and uh, without submission, uh, from exactly Muslim women that were struggling against this tremendous pressure made by these Islamist organizations to force them to wear veils. Uh, I've never seen no one in the European institutions caring with them, supporting them, understanding what uh, that they were entitled to have the same freedoms as anybody else of any religion, of any race, ethnic um, upbringing, or whatever. Uh, yeah. This universality was being denied to them. Uh, and I really wondered what did the European institutions did, do for supporting such women. And suddenly, finally, we saw in our screens in Iran what women really think. And suddenly people started to realize that all of this conversation, all of this propaganda, um, like uh, there would be you know, a repression of, of uh, women that decide to wear veils in Europe, uh, is just to hide the reality. And the reality is that there are women that are murdered for not wearing the veil as these people, these uh, fanatics think that they should be doing. And this is the problem, not the reverse. Um, and I'm very glad to see that in the European Parliament, people understood that the trivialization of the obligation of the veil, as many others, because I've been assisting to the campaign made by uh, not the Muslim Brotherhood itself, not only the NGOs that are obviously Muslim Brotherhood, but some that pretend not to be, but that are obviously made funded by the same sources uh, to uh, make the to pass the Burkina Faso, Bur 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 sorry, the Burkini, the uh, the veil, and so on, as things that are, uh, have to be trivial uh, to be uh, people to be obliged to to. To, to have them. Um, and so this is a very important thing you are doing in the European Parliament, and I do expect that we continue our cooperation across continents, borders. Iran is now the focus, but of course, you know, well, Egypt, I've been there many times, and I really, uh, I, I love this country, and I, I think it is uh, one of the most promising countries, uh, and I, I'm really delighted to have somebody here that has a lot of Egyptian experience and that wrote a book. I did not read it yet. Uh, I just read a, a very important summary that is available in the, in the Middle East Quarterly, which is uh, a publication uh, that is uh, uh, edited by uh, the Middle East Forum, headed by uh, Daniel Pipes, and he is the one who, who makes the summary. Uh, Daniel Pipes, uh, whom I happen to know very, uh, um, you know, uh, very occasionally in in, in Paris, um, in exactly the Iranian resistance uh, gatherings, uh, probably doesn't remember me, but um, I do still remember him. And, and uh, I was really amazed with his uh, summary. I think that uh, um, the secret apparatus, the Muslim Brotherhood industry of death—that's the title of your book. 
um, uh, is uh, certainly something that one has to read. Cynthia, um, I'm really looking very much forward to read your book, uh, but now the floor is yours. And uh, please tell us, what do you think about this nebula or galaxy or whatever you want to call it, and the way that we are dealing with it in the West? Please, the well, floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your heroic work in the european parliament i think it's uh, it's Please. utterly uh, and absolutely yeah. necessary um i uh, the, the reason I, I i wrote the book and the reason i call it the secret apparatus is because that is what the muslim brotherhood calls its own covert terrorism wing. The subtitle of my book, The Industry of Death, is not my hyperbolic interpretation of their activities. That is actually what they literally call their project. They say we are an industry of death. That's their own words, not mine. Um, so there isn't a book, uh, to my knowledge, in the West about the secret apparatus. If you talk to academics, both in Europe and in the United States, about the Muslim Brotherhood terror apparatus, they will tell you, oh, that's a thing of the past. It was dismantled in the 40s, some will say in the 50s, some will say in the 60s. And that was actually news to me. I didn't know that it was dismantled until I came to America in 2011. And I said, <laughs> when did that happen? Because they do the Arafat thing when they speak about the topic in English or in French or in German. They say, oh, that's a thing of the past. We are a political organization when they speak in Arabic, they say we are an industry of death. We come to you with slaughter. That's a quote, by the way. Um, so it's it's so what I try to do in my book is use their own words. There are 945 footnotes, predominantly from their own sources, to document what they have been saying. The Muslim Brotherhood said that they are the revival, uh, specifically uh, a member. A founding member of the secret apparatus called Ali Ashmawi said the Muslim Brotherhood is the revival of the 11th and 12th century Shia cult of the assassins. The cult, the word assassin itself comes from the word al-hashashin, assassin, and then became assassins. So they are saying, not me, they are saying we are the revival of the assassins. Now, they have something called the general apparatus, which is uh, the political PR facade that caters to the most important covert wing, which is the secret apparatus. Come, sometimes they call it the special apparatus. And now that wing also has a subdivision called the International Apparatus, which operates in the West. Uh, and they call themselves the vanguards of organized invasion. Now, that's a very dramatic title, also not mine. That's what they call themselves, the vanguards of organized invasion. They are trying to invade your countries through two different modes of operation. One is through terrorism, and one, sadly, is even more destructive. It's what they call in Arabic, Amaliya Jihadiya Hadariya, which is, which is uh, civilization uh, uh, operation, civilization jihad operation. And that's a very sinister operation. According to their own documents, not my conspiracy theory, a Muslim Brotherhood member is a soldier that conscripts every cell in his body to elevate his agenda uh, through various means to cater to the more violent wing. Now, it's commonly known that Hamas is also an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's commonly known that PLO is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, but According to the Muslim Brotherhood's own words, 
Al-Qaeda is a military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. Osama bin Laden, Abdullah Azam, and Ayman al-Zawahri were all, were all card-carrying members of the Muslim Brotherhood until they died according to the words of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, when you look at Islamic states, ISIS or ISIL, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. When you look at Jamaat al-Tawheed wal-Jihad, uh, the uh, monster al-Zarqawi who introduced uh, video decapitations to the world was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, that's, that, 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 that's according to the Brotherhood's own words also. That's not intelligence from Westerners or from Islamophobes. That's what Islamists say and brag in Arabic. So they do uh, indeed establish these wings. And according to the bylaws of the secret apparatus, before a member decides to uh, start a new terror group, he has to pretend to sever ties with the main organization and keep the continue, continue the discourse with the main body of the Muslim Brotherhood a secret. They even have to lie to their own wives and children that they sever ties with the Muslim Brotherhood. The same thing applies to elements of the covert uh, operation, which is uh, targets uh, non-governmental uh, institutions, NGOs. It, government, it, it, it also targets uh, governmental institutions and bodies. Um, Hassan al-Turabi, an international leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, said on a video that was aired in 2016 on Al Jazeera that the Muslim Brotherhood controls the narrative about the organization inside intelligence agencies in the West. These are his words, not mine. <laughs> they say we have we've infiltrated them. We control the narrative uh, through people that work in these organizations and through sources that they think are trustworthy. That's a big problem. The, 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 a lot of this is lost in translation. The Muslim Brotherhood also utilizes propaganda better than the Nazis, better than the Soviets, because what they have done to their political mission is uh, cloak it in religious, in a religious facade. So imagine if the Nazis decided to say, oh, we are a religion. This is what we're dealing with. The vast majority of Muslims actually abhor and are terrorized by this organization. The biggest rally in history, which was over 20 million people uh, that came out to the street against terrorism, was in Egypt in 2013 against the Muslim Brotherhood. These were predominantly Muslims. Uh, the biggest and first targets of the Muslim Brotherhood are Muslims. They have an extermination program for Muslims, which they call the blood tax. So who's Islamophobic now? The person who says don't kill Muslims or the person who has a program that calls the blood tax where they believe they should ritually sacrifice Muslims to Allah so they would get they would be forgiven for abandoning sharia law and the propaganda tactic goes uh, also when it targets westerners they use words like freedom truth liberty justice when you look in my book you will see what they mean by these words there are alternative definitions theological definitions from their own writings and their own words that mean the exact contrary meanings of these words and what they do is also gain sympathy by adopting the grievance du jour whether it's racism whether it's intersectionality they latch onto these causes while they themselves in their literature are extremely racist and sexist and uh, anti-semitic and xenophobic so what i am trying to do is uh, break that uh, a problem that gets lost in translation. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Cynthia. I think this was uh, uh, a wonderful introduction. So uh, we did um, have um, the politician, 
the person in charge of the of the budget control uh, that is uh, saying clearly that uh, uh, the democratic political establishment is uh, getting alert of uh, this infiltration problem of uh, uh, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood uh, into the system. Uh, this uh, report uh, that uh, you 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 uh, mentioned uh, the global says that the global Muslim Brotherhood uh, has uh, um, been provided by the European institutions since uh, 2004 uh, nearly 80 uh, million euros, which is um, a very impressive sum. Uh, I think uh, perhaps that uh, this is something that should be really better understood. How, how does it work? And we had Cynthia uh, who uh, really made uh, a very thorough investigation. Uh, she, uh, unlikely uh, persons like me, she speaks Arabic. <laughs> it's her native language, so so she can understand much better uh, what is going on, you know, because, uh, for instance, um, Al Jazeera uh, has uh, the Arabic section of Al Jazeera and the English section of Al Jazeera are very different things. Um, they say very different things, and they have uh, two realities. And speaking about Al Jazeera, which is uh, one of the most obvious um, vehicles for uh, Muslim Brotherhood propaganda, that sometimes pretends to be very liberal, very open, and so forth, but uh, knows very well uh, what it is aiming at. So this was a brilliant uh, introduction, and so um, I uh, I would like uh, uh, to um, to pose two general questions to to both of you all to Thomas. Uh, Thomas, do you think it's possible to think of uh, Europe? to really uh, command um, a study of uh, this um, influence uh, of uh, uh, the Islamist influence within the uh, European uh, um, world, if this is possible to, uh, to, uh, to conceive. Um, and uh, to think, yeah, you know, uh, we are South Asia Democratic Forum, and one of the things that really, um, you know, uh, puzzled me more since I've been uh, in this um, directing this South Asia Democratic Forum is is the lack of attention that both in Europe and the United States we give to jihadism in South Asia. We sometimes think it is something of the Middle East, uh, something that was uh, well created in Egypt, and uh, that's it. Well, but uh, I did. I did go very much on the on the issue, especially there is a there is a paper that is uh, uh, written by the, the full SADF team. But I was the main contributor in 2017. It is in our website, facing Jamaat e Islami in Bangladesh, a global threat in need of a global response. Where uh, you know I uh, see Jamaat e Islam as important as. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in, uh, in the 20s, the Caliphate movement that preceded uh, Jamaat -e Islam, uh, Maududi, uh, Maududi uh, meeting uh, in the 60s in Mecca with Khomeini, for instance. I think it is crucial. Uh, of course, it, it is important to consider um, you know, his meeting with Albana that you, you also refer to in, in your book, according to the uh, Daniel Pipes summary. But um, I think... Uh, South Asia uh, is a crucial, crucial aspect of this question. And uh, I think it has not been very well understood and not very much focused. And I would like, Cynthia, if you could give your opinion on this. So these are the two general issues. But perhaps I would start uh, with Thomas, uh, if he wants to tell us something on uh, how do you think that, um, you know, Europe could... Um, launch a bit of a research of what's going on with uh, this uh, Islamist infiltration in the European institutions. 
I think that really it's perfect to have it these discussions because we have it really much more and much more deeply uh, really be involved in the issue of Muslim Brotherhoods because this or organization it's very well organized. They know how to behave. They know they are much more better than some of terrorists or jihadist groups. What we know from, from the Middle East, also Muslim Brotherhoods, they are owner of some travel agencies. They know very well how to make the business. They know very well how to present themselves that they are speaking in the name of many Muslims. And many countries in the Western European, especially Western European countries, are absolutely wrong because they don't know how to behave to this organization. And many of them, they are very naive because they think that uh, if they will make the step down and they will give them the power, they will respect them, they will not infiltrate them with the intelligences, they will not uh, really doing something against this uh, organization. This organization will really follow the democratic principles and they will really fight in a Muslim community community for democratic um, democratic values but it's this is not true and muslim brotherhoods if you are really watching the news and you are watching the videos and you ha have it information from the intelligences what they are saying in the in the close meetings where they feel secure, they are absolutely against the European values. They are absolutely against the, the principles what we are generally using in the EU. And EU have to start really very well cooperated with the country like Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, uh, Jordan, of course, it's very difficult, difficult, but with Syria and with with Emirates and Bahrain and with many countries, for, would have it real experience with fighting this uh, this uh, extremist and radical groups. And from my point of view, it's very important shows and open this uh, debate in the European level. Because especially in European Parliament, in European Commission, and in member states, there are many politicians, but they don't have it, any clue about these topics. They think that they are safe, secure, and everything will be function. How is it uh, going now? But it's not true. The time change, and this organization change a lot. And... Uh, now we are discussing about mafia. I think they have it the same behavior. They are many times uh, on the principle of the families and they are many times very well organized. And uh, I think it's the time to take very clear decision about banning this organization. Also from my point of view, uh, the EU have two responses very very clear and the uh, eu have to really show that uh, we have it internal power to stop this um, this organization to infiltrate democratic institution that's my point of view thank you very much thomas uh, this is uh, very encouraging uh, indeed i think most of the european uh, people do not uh, uh, thinks that well, uh, uh, Europe, uh, well, in the United States, we'll, we have to look about the, these uh, uh, jihadists and these extremist ideas coming from uh, Muslim countries. But actually, it is now the reverse. I mean, it is uh, Muslim countries that are alarmed with the the, the free willing of uh, uh, extremists in Europe that are destabilizing their countries. The, the Emirates is a case in point. 
uh, and there are others in, in the north of Africa um, uh, as well. Uh, and so this is really crucial to get this question up to the um, European debate. And uh, uh, I'm very thankful for the fact that you are there and uh, you will be uh, an agent of uh, making these very important issues to be debated on the European sphere. Um, we are uh, having already questions, but perhaps passing to the before passing to the question that uh, we have already um, here, I would give the, the floor to Cynthia if she wants to, to comment on the issue uh, I raised. Uh, that's a, a phenomenal uh, question because uh, Abul Al Al Maududi, he is uh, one of the godfathers of modern Islamic jihad uh, because what he did was uh, start to communicate the ideas of uh, the Islamic Caliphate and the ideas of perpetual warfare, the perpetual jihad, which they call the Wamil jihad, where uh, war is a constant and everything else uh, caters around it. He was one of the first proponents of this idea and communicating it in modern language to be accessible uh, for recruitment of Islamists. He also did something very interesting, which is uh, instead of using the word caliphate, he started to use the word hakimiya. Hakimiya exactly means caliphate, it's Islamic theocracy. And uh, jihadists still today use that term. Uh, you will almost never hear a regular Muslim use that term. When I tell my Muslim friends, do you know what hakimiya is? They think it, they think, they think I'm speaking a different language. They do not understand it, although it's an it's a it's a, it's a, it's a uh, derived from the Arabic word hukm, which is governance. So it's Islamic governance, and uh, I. Sayyid Qutb, uh, the uh, terror theologian of the Muslim Brotherhood, was extremely influenced by the ideas of al-Mawdudi and he transported them to the Middle East. Uh, when al-Mawdudi started writing in the 20s, it's not a coincidence that Al-Azhar University in Egypt, which is controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, sent um, a delegation to India to communicate with him in the early 30s. And that constituted the first form of coalition between the two wings in South Asia and the Muslim Brotherhood, which still continues in, until today between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Taliban, between the Muslim Brotherhood and the vast majority of Sunni jihadist groups in South Asia I actually struggle to find a single group that they were not involved with uh, in an organizational uh, fashion. Th thank you so much, uh, Cynthia, uh, for this uh, very uh, clear uh, contribution of yours on um, on the you know the the South Asian the Indian contribution. Uh, actually, you know, I, I was just reading today a very recent report because uh, there is an organization called the Popular Front of India uh, that was just banned by uh, the Indian authorities on the grounds that it is uh, a cover up for uh, Muslim Brotherhood activities, including terrorism in India. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things about this uh, popular Front of India, uh, which I actually did not know, is that uh, it, uh, it was created in 2006, but it is succeeding another organization that had been formed before uh, in 1977 called the Students Islamic Movement of India, uh, with a clear Muslim Brotherhood agenda um, for India. And uh, this organization was created uh, by uh, a gentleman called uh, Muhammad Amadullah Siddiqui, 
at the time a professor of journalism and public relations at Western Illinois University in the United States. So already in 1977, Muslim Brotherhood was using the United States as uh, 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 the basis to hide uh, its uh, subversion mechanisms in countries like India. Uh, so it's not really a very recent phenomenon. It's a very, very well established one. Um, so what we are seeing in Europe uh, is really nothing uh, very, um, very new. Uh, it has a long tradition and uh, apparently we have not been paying enough attention. Uh, a lot of this phenomena, I, I already read, read, uh, read you, Cynthia, uh, writing about uh, contemporary things that are happening right now that are very interesting on, on, from this point of view. Well, we do have already a question coming from uh, 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 Dr. Siegfried Wolf, who is the, um, the director of research here in South Asia Democratic Forum. And uh, I suppose that uh, you, can, you can see it on, on the, if you click comments, you know, on the right side of your panel. And, but I'm going to, to read it. It's uh, on 29th of September, 2021. Charlie Hebdo revealed that there are close ties between the European institutions and the Muslim Brotherhood. Nevertheless, it appears that the, the EU continues to support financially events on which Muslim Brotherhood youth organizations like the Forum for European Muslim Youth and Student Organization gets invited and spread their radical views. Is there any debate on that and signs that the Commission is reconsidering its grants policy? So this is the question he raises. I don't know if Thomas or Cynthia, if you, if you want to, to um, react to it. Yeah. I think the question is absolutely absolutely perfect, and I think that we have to take action and take pressure against European Commission because European Commission is really in this in this things failed, and I think that really we have to criticize much more the the current Commission that the current Commission is doesn't. It's not very well understanding the problematic of uh, Muslim Brotherhood and all the organizations what are behind and how they are taking the money. Also, I think there is the times really to introduce uh, European Commission some reports of the of the intelligences and secret security because in the operation we have to see that they have it real data and real information about these NGOs who are linked with uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, European Commission is sometimes really uh, following their, their threats and problems and they are paying to their traitors and uh, people who are against the European values. And we have to stop it. Also, this is much more question about how to make the, the pressure against the against the this um, grants and the, this, this policy, because it, from my point of view, it's absolutely naive. And I will repeat it many times that the naivety of many EU organization, it's so big that you cannot imagine, and they don't understand. Um, this problematic a lot also it's very necessary to have it more discussion about Muslim Brotherhood and about using the EU funds from the European um, budget or, or much more misusing the EU funds from European budget Thank, thank you very much Thomas for uh, this uh, very uh, important clarification and uh, uh, this is really good to know that uh, you are on the top of this this issue. We have to go um, on it. Uh, we we shall not um, step back. But perhaps one of the issues that uh, uh, I think it's more uh, more interesting, as as I said in the beginning, in uh, in Cynthia's approach, uh, is um, contrary to a, a lot of uh, a lot of Westerners that really. Uh, uh, you know, they know nothing about Islam and uh, 
um, they uh, uh, go to to the Islamists for the Islamists to tell them about Islam, which is exactly what uh, uh, what should never be done. You know, and then they they even know less uh, than they knew before. Um, and one of the ideas is that oh no, Iran uh, is a Shia, so it's completely different. Oh, nothing to do, um, nothing to do. You know, it, uh, uh, because they are separated, they have been uh, so many conflicts, and they have, they have, and uh, they still do, as we know, uh, looking at Syria, for instance. Um, but uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something that is completely not true, and uh, Cynthia, um, because this is now, you know. Uh, in the top of the agenda, uh, people are realizing how the Islamist regime uh, is uh, um, absolutely hated by the Iranian people, um, and uh, uh, that Iran has a an, in an expressionist policy in the region that has been really destabilizing the whole of the region and is now destabilizing Europe is uh, side by side with uh, with Russia aggressing. Uh, Ukraine committing crimes of war with its uh, drone fleet, targeting civilian populations, civilian infrastructure. Iran is now part of the war against uh, Europe. One has to, to be very cautious of this. And uh, um, could you tell us a bit about this relation between uh, the Iran clergy and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, thank you for that question, because um, uh, om almost exclusively the focus has been on the sectarian differences between the Sunni and the Shia sects. Uh, but I have, uh, what I've done in my book is trace 14 centuries of cooperation. There is a very strong heritage for the cooperation. There is an uh, important Egyptian saying that explains that very nicely. Uh, the saying is, my brother and I are against my cousin and my cousin and I are against the stranger. So while they can fight, they can kill each other for centuries. It is a domestic issue. Um, the uh, When it comes to Westerners, their ideas in treaties, foreign policy, international jihad are identical. And I'm providing sources from both Islamist Shia and Islamist Sunni uh, 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 theologian that they currently adhere to that exactly say what I'm saying. So that is the basis of the co cooperation. It's, it's, ident it's ideological. And they have been, like for example, in 1938, Rohallah Khomeini, before he became an Ayatollah, visited Hassan al-Banna in his office and was mesmerized by Hassan al-Banna. And he was convinced that they should have a joint jihad project against both Muslim nations that they see as houses of war and, of course, against non-Muslims. And that was this, the first modern seed of the actual cooperation uh, between militants of both sects. Uh, it's incredible how Islamists do not think of policy in terms of years or decades. They look at it in terms of centuries. And Hassan al-Banna built upon that and his organization built upon that. They actually delivered on a demand made by a leader of Persia in 1743 called Nadir Shah that, they sh that the Sunnis should adopt the Shia sect as a fifth school of jurisprudence. Now, that demand was made in 1743. Who delivers on that demand in 1963? The Muslim Brotherhood officially identified the Shia Jafari sect as a fifth school of jurisprudence in Al-Azhar University, and they started something called the uh, proximity project, which is headquartered in Iran. And it says on its own website, not my conspiracy theory, that 
its aim is to uh, unify jihadists and create a unified uh, base for them in Iran. And incredibly, when you look at the Muslim Brotherhood discourse, who are Sunni, it is 100% on the side of Iran. When Iran and Iraq went to war together, you would think that a Sunni group like the Muslim Brotherhood would take the side of the Sunni Saddam Hussein. But the exact opposite is what happened. The Muslim Brotherhood was 100% on the side of the Iranian regime, and they went out and said, and I quote, the Iranian revolution is your revolution end of quote, when they were talking to their Sunni base. Who is the biggest uh, supporter in the Middle East for an Iranian nuclear program? The Muslim Brotherhood, consistently, always uncompromising. They have even met with Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Brigade in Iran in 19... Uh, sorry, in 2000 and uh, late 2012, early 2013, the then Muslim Brotherhood regime in Egypt met with Qasem Soleimani because they wanted to have a joint uh, militia inside Egypt against the common enemies, which is 99% of Muslims and Coptic Christians and atheists and all segments of society. Uh, when the Iranian revolution in 1979 was perpetrated by Ayatollah Khomeini, the first plane that landed after the revolution was Yasser Arafat. The second plane was the plane that belonged to the secret apparatus of the Muslim Brotherhood. And a lot of the Current leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood were on this flight, including Rashid al Ghanoushi, who is celebrated as a moderate Muslim, <laughs> while all his life, all his life, all his writings have been for agitation of warfare, mass murder, ritual sacrifice, and genocide. So, it's uh, it's it's truly truly uh, incredible, and I don't think this relationship will ever be severed. The Muslim Brotherhood branch in Iran is still very active and very operational, and uh, I I I think that's why uh, there has to be a, a designation of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terror group, and everyone who works with it, whether. No, whether they are in um, uh, NGOs or whether are uh, working inside government institutions or academic institutions. Thank you. <laughs> Cynthia, thank you so much for this brilliant lesson. Uh, it was really, really something. But uh, let me tell you that uh, perhaps the third airplane landing in Tehran uh, had actually was coming from from Pakistan and had uh, uh, Maududi. Uh, Maududi uh, was there speaking, and uh, there are actually, uh, uh, you know, the the summaries of the conversations between Khomeini and uh, Maududi. And uh, Khomeini was fundamentally explaining to him, "Well, uh, now I am in power. Uh, I am the number one. So uh, we 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 do not want any sectarian division in Islam." But needless to say, I am the commander. You obey. <laughs> well, that's where, where normally uh, the things get a bit uh, more complex between all these different factions of, um, of Islam. But, uh, you know, Westerners tend to think, you know, like, for instance, the Al-Qaeda and its uh, latest dissidents, the, the Caliphate, Islamic State, all the, they are uh, shooting at each other. Oh, they are big enemies. Oh, we have to... Um, uh, cooperate with one of the factions, it's useless, uh, not the way to, to go. And Cynthia, I think that your lesson was precious. Uh, we are ending uh, um, now uh, the, um, uh, our, uh, our webinar. Um, I, um, if uh, you do not uh, have anything else to, to add, I would like to thank very much uh, um, Thomas for 
taking some of uh, your time to um, to join us. Cynthia, you have been brilliant. I have never seen you before. Uh, I read about you, and I, I am very, very glad that uh, we could uh, meet. I think that uh, um, I'm always reading uh, what Daniel Pipes is writing, and I think that we have to thank Daniel Pipes for for this uh, for this uh, uh, gathering. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, to both of you, thank you to all that have been uh, assisting us uh, on the backstage, Madalena and Albino, uh, and uh, thank you to all of those who participated in um, through the social media, uh, and I hope we will have future occasions to continue our cooperation, and uh, we will uh, see you uh, next time. So thank you very much and till the next opportunity. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.